So welcome to this last uh, MF Kasser lunch of the spring term. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure to see so many here today and to really to see you all um, again. So today, Jesse Uphoff will present parts of his research for us in a talk called Augustine on the Material Experience of Divine Learning. Uh, and it's in many, many ways a particular joy to sit here with Jesse today, uh, both because he's defending his thesis on Wednesday, next Wednesday. Hey. <laughs> and then there's, there's one more reason, because he was the first communication and web administration assistant for MF Kosser. And we should give him a, yet another round of applause for having done that so well. So I'm, I'm wearing a mask today, and that's because I just have a little cold, but I don't think you should get it now this last week before his um, I'm very grateful. defending his thesis. So. So you, you know the drill, uh, 13 minutes talk, 13 minutes of Q&A and discussion. You know that you have to move over to the microphone, microphone to talk if you're in this room. And if you're with us on Zoom, you have to use the chat function and Esther will read the question that you post there. Please, Great. welcome. Well, thank you for that introduction and for inviting me to share. And thank you to everyone who came in person and online. Um, like the, Leaving a board said, I spent several years organizing this. So it's a it's a pleasure to get to sit here and not just for setting up the camera properly. Um, what I want to share with you today comes from a chapter of my dissertation, which I'll be defending uh, next week. My project focuses on the way Latin authors use the term gospel. And while reading Augustine's work, De Doctrina Christianity, <laughs> De Doctrina Christiana, I discovered that this terminology is central to the way that he discusses the relationship between the material sensory experience um, and divine learning. So there are a number of interesting findings in my dissertation, I think, but <laughs> given MF's strong competence uh, in material cultural religion, I thought this would be particularly relevant here. Uh, to cover this topic in a way that is brief, I will first uh, sketch out the way it plays in the text and then discuss how it intersects with later antique scribal practice. So I should mention just how much interesting scholarship uh, has been done in the last decade on the sensory engagement uh, with texts and their material forms. I have brought with me just a few examples of literature devoted to that topic. And all of these volumes, despite their different angles and periodizations, include one particularly potent example, the Gospel Codex, particularly its liturgical uses during the Middle Ages. All of these books have something to do with that. This book is all about that. What I want to focus on today is not the current analysis of those practices, but one of the main texts that inspired them. Augustine's De Doctrina Christiana was the definitive authority for using and interpreting scripture from the fifth to the 15th centuries in the Latin West. So how does this watershed text treat the materiality and the sensory experience of scripture? And what else can we find? Where else can we find this discussion happening in the late fourth and early fifth centuries? Augustine opens his work with a prologue, which is very often ignored. And in it, he refutes three kinds of opponents who might disagree with his approach. The first group simply does not understand what Augustine is up to. The second understands what he's saying, but lacks the faculties or education to follow his method. Both of those groups are easily dismissed as inept critics. But the third group is a little more difficult. They claim to have a divine gift that allows them to understand the scriptures without human aid by the Holy Spirit. This claim to spiritual knowledge apart from human means is more serious because they might be tempted to uh, go and hear the gospel and learn in church or not read the codex and not hear the reading or preaching from a human teacher, expecting to be carried off into the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, according to the words of the apostle, and there to hear unutterable words, which it is not lawful for man to speak, and there to see the Lord Jesus Christ and hear the gospel from him rather than from men. So what is at stake here is whether Christians pursue divine knowledge through pure spiritual enlightenment or whether they use their senses 
to hear the gospel read aloud and see it written in a manuscript. The discussion around hearing and seeing the human sensory experience of words and their relationship to divine learning continues through the four books. In book one, uh, Augustine is explaining the incarnation and he does so using words themselves as uh, an analogy. The word of God is made flesh, but retains its divine qualities the same way that a word, uh, when we speak a word, it comes from our mind and becomes a sound from our mouths so that it can travel into the ears of another person and take up residence in their mind. And the nature of that word doesn't change while in our mind. So he uses how this semiotic theory to explain the incarnation. And the incarnation of the word made flesh is really the first step in understanding how human forms of communication can make the divine known to us. In book two, Augustine describes two kinds of signs, natural signs, which flow out of the nature of a thing like smoke from fire and given signs by which a communicator purposefully uses a sign to transmit something from their mind to another. And the scriptures are given signs with a mixture of divine and human agency. The text reads, in this category of signs, as far as it concerns humans, we are determined to consider and investigate because divine signs are contained in the divine scripture and have been communicated to us by the humans who wrote them. So while the scriptures do describe some signs communicated to other senses, such as the smell of perfume on Jesus's feet as a sign of his anointing, or the taste of his body and blood in the sacraments. Most signs are communicated to the eyes and to the ears. And the chief among those signs are words. Words are fundamentally oral, spoken to be signs to the ears. However, since words which are spoken cease to exist right away, letters were invented as signs of words for the eyes. Words then are signs which can be taken in by the two main senses, by the ears or by the eyes, depending on the context. And the scriptures are words written by humans which contain divine signs waiting to be understood. But to do so, we must approach them through carefully understanding the words that we take in through our senses. In book three, Augustine, following Paul's reasoning in Romans, discusses the Jews writing that they did not understand that the words which they had in the law were signs to higher meaning, but instead lived in slavery to the signs themselves. And the Gentiles make a similar mistake by treating the gods as signs for the created order when they ought to be worshiping the creator as the one true thing. However, Christians who are spiritually free know how to recognize <laughs> the signs instituted by God as signs and worship the reality behind them. And so raise the mind's eye above creation to drink of the eternal light. Finally, in book four, Augustine advises everyone setting out to communicate the gospel to also pray so that they may work with God. It reads, just as medicines of the body, which are applied to humans by humans, do no good unless God brings about health, who is able to heal even without them. So too, the aids of teaching are useful to the spirit if they are applied by humans, with God acting, doing good, who is able to give the gospel to man though not from humans or through humans. Here the discussion of human agency in divine revelation has come full circle, where Augustine began by criticizing those who claim to understand and teach the meaning of scripture without the help of human learning. He wraps up by imploring those who have learned how to understand the scriptures as human signs and communicate them through effective rhetoric to also pray so that their work might have a positive spiritual impact. There's one path to divine learning for Augustine. It runs through the human sensory experience of the materiality of the embodied scriptures. The path to seeing the risen Christ and hearing the gospel from him begins with the gospel codex used in the liturgy. Within that framework, there are some passages about the scriptures and about their manuscripts in particular that take on greater significance. One is his listing of the books of scripture in book two. And most books 
are listed very plainly. For example, when discussing the Catholic epistles, he says there are two of Peter, three of John, one of Jude, and one of James. And that's all the information that you really need from his view. For Paul, he includes the names of the cities for each letter. But for the gospel, it reads, the New Testament contains the four book gospel, according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, according to John. For Augustine and some others like Ambrose, the term gospel is always in the singular, even though there are multiple accounts. And this phrasing plays on this semiotic system of signs and things in which a singular gospel thing has four signs. However, Augustine's word choice is not only theoretical. It is grounded in the paratextual features of gospel codices. Evangelium secundum Matthaeum is a common formula used at the beginning, ending, and running headers of gospel manuscripts. While this phrasing is used by other authors occasionally, usually only referring to a single gospel text at a time, this is the only place I've been able to find where it's represented so systematically um, and all together. Later on, this formula is repeated, notably by Cassiodorus quoting Augustine. However, at this stage, there are only two places this kind of formula is found, De Doctrina Christiana and the Paratex of Gospel Manuscripts. The question then is how Augustine's theory of signs and things relates to these scribal conventions. In other words, when we read the gospel according to Matthew in the margins of a manuscript, is it only communicating where we are in the codex or is it also commuting some, communicating something about the relationship between the text we are reading and the heavenly gospel? To begin to answer that, it's necessary to establish the sorts of manuscripts that Augustine used. And second, to discuss what kinds of frameworks uh, and paratext, paratext can convey to us. Establishing which sorts of manuscripts might contextualize Augustine is actually fairly easy because of the amount of material we have on Augustine. At this point in his career, he consistently uses a Latin text type, which he calls Itala, and which is no associated with the manuscript tradition of the church in Milan. He comments on how some ecclesiastical communities are more careful with their textual criticism than others. And his preference for this text type is so strong that some have speculated that when Augustine traveled from Milan, he brought copies of the scriptures with him in preference over the local variants in Africa. Additionally, the earliest known manuscript of De Doctrina Christiana, uh, which was probably made during Augustine's lifetime, seems to have been copied in North Africa, but traveled to Milan fairly quickly. So there's an ongoing intellectual conversation between the Bishop of Hippo and the community of textual scholars in Milan and Northern Italy. And the manuscripts that we have from that area, such as Codex Corbiensis Secundus and Corbix Veronesis, use the paratextual conventions described above almost to the letter. I think it's fair to say that Augustine is drawing on the scribal conventions of the Milanese community in the language of his canon list. But is this a two-way conversation? Do these manuscripts reflect a hermeneutical system in which the gospel codex is a collection of signs for the eyes pointing to a singular heavenly gospel? Ancient editorial practices were, much as modern editorial practices are, shaped by a scribe's interpretation of the text that they are working with. And they use the material manuscript to communicate a framework of interpretation to their reader. Eric Sherbensky refers to this dynamic as editorial hermeneutics. While it has always been a part of the way texts are transmitted, this dynamic took on new forms for Christian editors with the use of the codex, which allows for the transmission of advanced paratextual features and editorial decisions designed to bring readers to a text in a particular manner. Just as one example, putting multiple books between the same two covers conveys a strong sense of univocality, which is true for the Pauline corpus or the gospels or other collections. So paratexts do transmit hermeneutical frameworks, whether they do so deliberately or not, or, and whether they are overt or implicit. It seems plausible to me that these editorial hermeneutics of these Northern Italian manuscripts relate at an intellectual level to Augustine's theory of signs and things or something very much like it. This is by no means the only hermeneutical framework used by authors and editors to shape the reader's interpretation of the gospel, but it is one that persists for centuries, 
both in the text of De Doctrina Christiana and in the conventions of gospel manuscripts. I think that uh, fills up my time, uh, but I would love to hear your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you so much.